We're joined now by one of the most important people at the University of Illinois and one that will stick around for a little bit longer. Illinois Athletic Director Josh Whitman joins now. First of all, Josh, congratulations on the contract that takes you through 2028. Thank you very much. Uh, incredibly grateful to have a chance to continue the work we've started. Thankful to the Chancellor, the President, our Board of Trustees, and really it's an endorsement of all of our people here and the great work that they've been doing these last six and a half years. And, just excited to continue what we started. Well, it's been a long year since the last time we've been able to sit down like this. The common phrase has been name image likeness. So I think we'll start there at the beginning of the new year. New law goes into effect in the state of Illinois, allowing universities like the University of Illinois to be involved in that NIL process. How has Illinois getting prepared for that? We've tried to be on the, on the front edge of it from the beginning. We hired gentleman named Cam Cox is the first NIL coordinator in our history uh, about this time last year and Cam's come on board. He's a trained attorney, uh, incredibly bright and has been very active in this space both locally but, but nationally as well. Uh, and, and we continue to monitor the space, try and innovate as we can. Uh, I think we're very much in this evolutionary phase where um, people are testing boundaries, trying new things. Uh, and so we want to make sure that uh, we're doing things the right way, but also that we're pushing the envelope and, and looking for new ways to, to capitalize on, on NIL for the betterment of our student athletes and ultimately of our program. You said athletes getting paid is that next frontier. How do you envision the university navigating that going forward? I, I think it will become important in the not too distant future for universities like ours to consider ways to share uh, some of uh, the revenue that our programs generate with the student athletes more directly. Whether that means they ultimately are classified as employees or not, I think is a different question. Um, but I, I think that there needs to be some, some open discussion about how we can create uh, that possibility for the young men and women wearing our uniform. And uh, I don't have a lot of details about ultimately what it could look like, um, but I, I do think that uh, it's, it's inevitable at this point that, that we move that direction. I hope we can do so proactively rather than waiting on somebody on the outside, a court or a legislative body to tell us that we have to. More NIL player group licensees are getting put together now, like ones for trading cards, some for video game licenses. Do you think that is a step in the direction of player unions? And what are your thoughts on that? I think that athletes coming together to collaborate on group licensing is a, is a great step. Uh, I, I don't know that uh, unions are, are an eminent part of our future. I, I think that we work really hard to try and, and be comprehensive in the benefits that we provide student athletes. I, I would put our, our health care up against anybody's. I would put a lot of the, the time constraints that have been put in place through the NCAA up against anybody's. I, I think that our student athletes as a subset of our university population have about the best experience of anybody you're going to find and I feel strongly about that. Um, but I, I do think that you know, we need to continue to find ways to engage with them, get feedback from them, look for ways to be better in the things that we're doing to enhance their experience. And, I have a lot of confidence, at least here at the University of Illinois, that we're doing that. Talking about some of the facilities now, you said that a dream makeover of Memorial Stadium would be $200 million. That's not on the table right now, but you are making some incremental changes. What are those changes and what is still maybe on the back burner that's not able to be done now? Yeah, for us, I think when our fans come in the building this fall, especially those who sit on the east side, they'll see some meaningful improvements. We have now polished concrete floors throughout the east concourse. We have uh, new LED lighting in the East Great Hall. We've taken out what had been the boarded up old windows, opened those up to allow more natural light into the building. We've uh, painted our steel infrastructure in the Great Hall with a nice navy color. We put in new larger TVs. We put epoxy flooring into our bathrooms. Uh, we've gone through and, and power washed the entire interior bowl of the stadium. These are all things that start to move us in the direction of, of making sure that that stadium is a, a wonderful home for us for the next hundred years. Uh, what we won't do in the foreseeable future is sort of the, the grand project, something that is going to take the stadium offline in meaningful chunks for extended periods of time. Uh, just doesn't feel like the right time to undertake a project like that one. And so 
Uh, we'll, we'll work more in the margins. We'll, we'll look each summer to take a meaningful bite out of uh, here for the next little while, at least the east and the south, uh, and see if we can't make some, some meaningful improvement there to the experience that our fans enjoy. This fall will be the last season of the current deal with the IHSA to host the state football finals at Memorial Stadium. There's new bidding process going on right now. Where is Illinois at in that bidding process? We intend to be an active participant. We're very proud to have been a long time host of the IHSA football championships in Memorial Stadium. Uh, we have every expectation to continue to be that host. It's not something that we take for granted. Uh, so we'll put forward a competitive bid, excited to uh, engage with the leadership from the IHSAA, and uh, hopefully uh, create a new opportunity for that to continue to occur in the years ahead. The university now owns two golf courses with the opening of uh, Atkins over in Urbana as well as the University of Illinois golf course in Savoy. What does the future look like owning both of those properties with the university? Well, we technically own three golf courses. We've got the blue <laughs> course, the orange course, and, and now the Atkins club. And so uh, it's something that we'll continue to study as we go forward. Uh, obviously, Atkins club is, is a, a new player in the marketplace, at least here over the last few years. And, so we're, we're anxious to see how play uh, develops both at the Atkins Club and then what implications that course may have for the orange and blue and, uh, and what kind of activity they're generating out there. So we'll, we'll take some time uh, and, and take a, a holistic look at our entire golf course portfolio and figure out what the, what the right strategy is going forward. Has the orange and blue course made money in its history and do you see that continuing with the addition of Atkins as well? It has made money for us, and in, in large part that's due to the partnership that we have with the, the, the group that operates that, the, the Rotoms Group has been our operator out there for a long time. Um, so we're hopeful as we get through the summer, again, it, it'll be a little bit of a, an apples to oranges comparison just because we won't open the Atkins Club until kind of midpoint of the season. Um, but I think we'll still have some, some good data points as we, as we wrap up the golf season to, to make some, some informed decisions about what we want to do going forward. The transfer portal has been uh, a new aspect of this college sports world as well. What are your thoughts on how some of the powers that be in college athletics should police that going forward, or should they stay the way things are right now? I think it's still a bit early. I know everyone's a little unsettled around the transfer portal. It obviously has created some instability uh, in our rosters. I think that's something that makes us uncomfortable. I don't know that it makes the student athletes quite as uncomfortable. Uh, I think that over time we'll gain a better understanding of what uh, the transfer portal has really meant in terms of uh, new opportunities for student athletes. I, I have a sense that there are a lot more student athletes going into the portal than there are coming out of it. Uh, I think that it is a bit of a game of musical chairs and not everybody has a place to sit down when the music stops. I think as that story gains more traction and better understanding, we'll see less activity in the transfer portal. I do think that there may be some opportunities to modify it and still provide um, strong access to it in the right circumstances, but whether it's through the adoption of, of windows of time where it's open, uh, whether it's through some front-end residency requirement where we ask student athletes to stay on their original campus for a length of time to at least become acclimated and comfortable before they make a final decision whether it's the right place for them. Uh, I think there are some, some things that could be studied there and we'll just have to take some time and figure out what the right, uh, some of the right uh, polishing moments are for that, for that uh, opportunity. The Big Ten is in the middle of securing a new media rights deal. It's reported that per school that could jump up to possibly more than $70 million per year. I'm not asking you to confirm the numbers, but how impactful can that extra revenue be for the university? Anytime you talk about growing our revenue in such a meaningful way, obviously that's going to have a pretty profound impact for us. Um, but I, I think more than the money, it's really about the value that those media partners bring to our conference. And we've established ourselves in the Big Ten as one of, if not the premier college athletic conference in the country, and who we affiliate with in the media space has a lot to do with solidifying that reputation. And so being able to engage with some of the most notable media companies, not only in the country, but in the world, around how to provide a platform and visibility to, to Big Ten athletics 
is something that uh, we should never take for granted and I think provides us a great opportunity to continue to promote Big Ten sports and the student athletes who choose to join us. Gambling has continued to become a bigger part of the sports watching experience. It's now legal in Illinois to bet on Illinois colleges at the casinos. You've previously opposed that. Are you opposed to that going further to mobile gambling as well on schools within the state of Illinois? I, I am. I, I don't believe in allowing residents to gamble on our in-state student-athletes. I, I've been on the record in that position. I, I haven't changed that. I, largely it's driven through concern for the mental health and well-being of the, the young people who play our, our sports. I get on the buses after these games. They're, they're buried in social media. They're reading all the things people say about them, good and bad. And uh, because of the passion that our fans have, a lot of times some of that can, can bubble and tend toward the negative. If all of a sudden they're frustrated, not only because they're passionate and we got beat or there was a poor performance, but now they lost $500 or $1,000, I think that negative rhetoric escalates to a new level and I worry about what that means for the well-being of our, of our students. Um, I also am concerned about the environment on the campus. We have a lot of young people here who are engaging in that gambling experience. And our student athletes aren't living inside a bubble. They, they live in the residence halls. They, uh, walk to campus, they sit in class, and so their physical positioning with whether they're in a boot or whether they're injured or on crutches, um, their mental state, they know they've got a big test or something's going on. That there's just a level of access to them that is, I think, concerning in the gambling space. And so I, I have no problems gambling on sports, um, but you, you start to gamble on college athletes, and it makes me concerned. Um, and I, I think that. As a, as a state with our laws, uh, sometimes our laws are meant to signal what we believe. Uh, and, and I know that gambling happens uh, illegally, but I, I think that it's important that we signal as a, as a community of people that we stand behind our student athletes and, and their well-being. Josh, we appreciate your openness with us today. We appreciate your time as well. And here's looking forward to uh, us sitting again one more time a year from now. I'm looking forward to it. Thank you. Thank you.